Thank you. Um, wow. At this hour, so many people, there's clearly something wrong. You want to be in another talk, not in this one. Um, okay. okay. <laughs> We're all gone. Okay. Um, so, yeah, thank you for uh, the interest in my talk, CEO. Um, this is le a less technical talk, but I'm also bringing a couple of uh, funny things at the, at the end, so it's not too boring. So I wanted to reflect on the uh, Unix class that I've been uh, teaching for a while now, and I thought this would be interesting to this audience because um, you're also BSD folks, so I figured this might be um, something you might find interesting in. So um, this is basically the outline that I'm going to talk about. And um, uh, something a little bit about me. Some people know me already. So I'm uh, the well, co-host on the BSD Now podcast. Alan asked me actually last year to join uh, the podcast because Chris Moore didn't have enough time anymore to do it. Um, so I'm approaching my one year anniversary on BSD Now, which is cool. Uh, I'm also sitting on the FreeBSD core team. I'm also involved in the FreeBSD Foundation. I served there as the uh, vice president on the board. Wow, how did that happen? Um, <laughs> and, uh, but in my job. normal job, yeah, <laughs> bad luck, I guess. Um, but in my normal life, I'm a, um, a university um, system administrator at the University of Applied Sciences in uh, Germany, in Darmstadt. And um, so this is uh, more about my day job, less than my FreeBSD work. But I try to combine them in this talk a little bit so it's not um, too far off the BSD track. So um, I'm teaching a Unix lecture called um, Unix for Software Developers. And uh, so this is basically um, explaining a little bit how this came to be and why I'm teaching the things that I'm teaching and why I'm doing the things. And um, yeah, let's start with the lecture. But first, I should start with a little motivational talk that inspired me when I was starting out with Unix. Um, so this is an, an old uh, article on the OnLamp uh, site from, uh, what's that? Um, oh, what was that from? No, it's OnLamp. It, oh, what was that? O'Reilly, right. O'Reilly, right. And so this is kind of the motivational thing. It's also in the introductory chapter on Drew Levine's uh, BSD hacks. So this is um, also on my webpage that I'm going to show later on. Um, so this is the uh, theme for my lecture that I'm teaching. So Unix is, uh, for many people, very mysterious, something uh, a little intimidating, but also um, very fascinating. And once you get into the uh, under the hood, you find a lot of uh, cool gems and uh, really like the uh, underlying uh, things that are buried under the surface. And that's also where I start usually with my uh, lecture. So I present this to the students, and they're like, whoa, what, what's this guy talking about? Um, so, but the lecture actually started um, way before my time. So I was a student once, even though some people uh, will never recognize me as a student. So I started my studies at the computer science department where I currently work uh, in 2001. Wow, I feel old now. Um, so back then, I didn't have any Unix knowledge, so I had a, a DOS Windows background back then. Uh, I heard about Unix, but I'd never sat in front of a Unix system. And um, I had a little bit of programming knowledge, but this is basically just the start of my uh, university career. And um, so my first programming lecture I will never forget, uh, because we had a very engaging and very interesting professor. And uh, so um, he was kind of the um, catalyst for me to uh, explore Unix a little bit more. Uh, so he basically came into the lecture room. Everyone sat down, and he started the lecture with um, um, basically there are two groups in this computer science department. Um, the first group is using Unix. That's the group I belong to. And the second group is using Windows. That's everyone else. And after that, everyone was kind of hooked because he was kind of old school. So uh, <laughs> Professor Schütte um, ran uh, back in the day uh, Linux on his ThinkPad. And for most of the class that we were having, including me, uh, this was a new experience because we all just knew Windows and some of the um, more um, advanced system that he was, uh, was using there. So he pretty much opened his ThinkPad and did everything in the shell and the terminal. That was kind of a wow experience because I Way back when, I liked the DOS environment uh, and um, seeing the Unix environment for the first time with the tab completion and all the cool things you can do there, that was certainly something that I wanted to get more uh, information about. And he was also a very old school Unix, or he still is uh, an old school Unix professor. So he had the rare uh, ability to explain complicated things very easily so that everyone could understand it. 
And uh, sadly, many of the other professors uh, didn't have that skill or uh, didn't develop that skill. So I was um, really lucky to, to have his um, lecture introducing me to the more finer uh, points of uh, programming and operating systems later on. So uh, it's pretty much uh, his um, fault that I'm uh, standing here today because I not only um, took his uh, programming lectures but also operating systems and distributed systems and all that on Unix. So this is uh, really um, the eye-opening experience that I had back then. Uh, so later on, um, way back when, when I finished already and um, he had me uh, or asked me what I could um, help him a little bit with lab work and you know helping students, he was like, yeah, well, remember back when you uh, were sitting in the class and we were still a student and you were uh, seeing me using uh, Linux there back then and uh, he switched uh, to Mac OS uh, in the meantime. So that's pretty much um, every new student generation has the same experience. So professor opens his laptop, uses some kind of system, and they're now trying to emulate that environment. And that was kind of the, the uh, idea that's going to um, start it there. And I, and, it's, and I talk to students sometimes that having his classes and I see that they're having this experiences all over again. And this is kind of a, a nice thing to see. So um, back then, so um, right around my uh, master's uh, level, I was also experiencing a little bit um, with other Unixes. So I ran Debian for a long time. And uh, until one fateful day that uh, I found a um, FreeBSD ISO image and I was like, Oh wow, you can switch terminals real quickly. And that's, that took a long time on the Linuxes back then. So that kind of hooked me onto the BSD track, otherwise I wouldn't be doing this. So it's just terminal switching. It's just like, <laughs> whoa, how, how cool would that be? How often do you do that? Um, so that got me... Hmm? It's crazy how small things... Uh, yeah, just turn you totally into a different uh, environment. <laughs> and. Um, yeah, so um, from there on, I started discovering the BSDs a little bit more, uh, ran uh, Debian and uh, FreeBSD in parallel, and at one day I was like, oh, wow, you haven't booted this Debian system for a long time. Maybe I can do the complete switch over to FreeBSD. And that's what I did, and um, pretty much never looked back. Uh, so this is my, my main system, except the macOS. Um, but macOS is based on FreeBSD. Yeah, so there's, the right, there's the, the logical progression in that, <laughs> and uh, I feel quite at home. Uh, although people try to um, nag me a little bit and get a, get a FreeBSD desktop, some kind of uh, laptop that's running FreeBSD. Okay. Um, but the nice thing about that is that one day uh, Arish Schütte approached me. I was I'm now, by that time, I was now working in the university uh, department, um, because why not? And uh, he asked me whether I would be uh, willing, because I also took that lecture uh, at him. Uh, so this is an elective course. And he asked me whether I would be interested in taking over the class, because he was busy in other lectures and he couldn't do it anymore. So rather than having the lecture die, um, I would um, take over the lecture, basically holding the lecture, doing the labs, and also the exam. So this is the, the, the honor of passing the baton uh, from him to me. And uh, yeah, this is uh, pretty much how I got involved with this lecture. And since I took the lecture myself, I was kind of uh, in the know of where I was going to and what I was uh, expecting from the students, since I experienced most of the trouble that I had with that lecture uh, myself. So I, I knew what kind of uh, things needed to be uh, fixed. So what is this lecture, Unix for Developers? So it's basically an undergraduate uh, course that uh, Arish Schutte created in our uh, computer science department. And um, uh, this is um, all in, uh, in Darmstadt, Germany, where I, where I live. And so the goals back then is, so he noticed that a lot of people were interested in, in Unix, since he uh, showed this in his lectures all the time, but they didn't actually know how to do programming on Unix or what kind of things you could do on the terminal in shell scripting and other things. So he created this course and um, you know, uh, did it a couple of times until he passed it over to me. And so the um, required knowledge is basically you took his operating systems course and his, maybe his, his distributed systems course and you should know a little bit about programming and then you could basically go into these topics. So he covered um, a Unix overview, a little bit of history, where this all came from and what it's currently um, going to maybe or where it's currently at. Um, editors, yes, we were learning VI the hard way and I still... Um, well, yeah, it's not too bad. Uh, I tried also to um, expose the students to it, but not too much. So I know that there's immediately two groups, one that hate VI with a passion, and the other ones are like, eh, okay, I can still work with this editor. I can do inserts and other things. 
Um, so um, then we do a little bit of shell. What the shell can do this is basically what most people know about, so tab completion and you know history and stuff. So this is all the stuff that you uh, probably all know about. And from there, we uh, started getting into shell scripting and things you can do there to uh, like automate certain tasks and make sure that it um, runs certain tasks in a, in a fashion that you would never have done because there's no separate program for that. Uh, then we um, focus a little bit more about file systems. So back then, he was teaching about uh, how ext2 and 3, uh, that's way back when, uh, was working. And um, yeah, for me, my topics that I now change a little bit, I will go into this a little while, I'm um, focusing a little bit more on OpenZFS because I think that's something that the students should be exposed to, to just see what kind of cool things that OpenZFS uh, can provide. Uh, there's also the um, grep set and awk set chapter, which has most students just grown about, you know, oh, the crazy syntax that awk is using. Uh, but uh, they can also see what kind of cool things you can do with awk that you uh, wouldn't normally do or would have to do in a very complicated fashion nowadays. And what I added is, is Ansible, and uh, I added that last year because I thought this would be interesting to students. And the feedback that I got after the class when uh, the students got into their practicals uh, before they do their final thesis is that um, many of the companies are looking for students to know this already coming from the university and so that they uh, have a little bit of knowledge about how Ansible uh, works or how the whole um, configuration management thing is, uh, is uh, doing. Um, so this lecture is basically one and a half hours or so 90 minutes per week and um, we have also a three hour lab uh, every two weeks so we I uh, have a relatively uh, big lab so that students can um, get a couple of assignments done in this, uh, in this time frame um, so that they pretty much can get the exposure that they need to work with the actual systems. You can do this uh, lecture totally uh, theoretically, but it wouldn't help you much if you're really sitting on a Unix system. Uh, so this typically is five to six labs uh, over the semester. So this is typically uh, 14 weeks uh, that we have. And you know you cannot start the first lab on the first week because uh, yeah students don't know that much to to do something, um, but this is basically how how we structure this um, this lecture, and at the end there's a written exam of course. Uh, so for this semester um, the last uh, exam was just two weeks uh, two days ago uh, while I was on the way uh, here. So a colleague of mine uh, took over that. So just he would just watch people writing the exam in hands and collected it again. And which means when I come back from FOSS then the first thing I have to do is you know, create the exams. Um, but that's okay. So um, changes that I made to the course, I already mentioned the uh, addition of OpenZFS. Um, so when I took over the slides from uh, Alois Schütte, that when he passed over the, the lecture to me, uh, the slides were already outdated, so they were covering Linux 2.6, and I was like, ooh, I have to redo the slides anyway, so I might as well push a little bit BSD into it. Because the lecture is called uh, Unix for software developers and not Linux for software developers or BSD for software developers. So I'm trying to level it out a little bit, not just Linux, but also a little bit of BSD so that students can get an idea of what the two systems can do and what kind of uh, differences there are. Uh, I um, originally also held, the, so the lecture was uh, held in German originally. Um, but um, with the addition that we, our department is now doing with more international work, uh, they asked me whether I could um, switch this um, course language over into English. And so I said, yeah, let's try this. And uh, what I found is that it was relatively easy to do because all the technical terms didn't need to be translated at all. And I could just um, <coughs> use some of the, the slides from some conferences, take snippets in there, and put it in there. So it's just um, in English all the time. So this is the third time that I'm doing this now. And the German students like it and the exchange students. So I, I didn't lose any of those groups. Uh, so I'm trying to um, use this or uh, motivates me to keep this in English. Um, yeah, and for the students, so when you start a lecture in a German uh, university and you start in, in English, everyone is like, ooh, <laughs> do I understand what he's saying? But this is pretty much uh, how it goes all the time. And the second week, students um, kind of get familiar with uh, the, the talking speed and, you know, that you don't know all the words all the time. I mean, this is just me talking in English. And um, at, in the second week, they start warming up to the whole idea, and then they start raising their hands and asking questions. So this is also a good training for them to get into um, their 
uh, language skills. I mean, computer science is, is English anyway, so they might as well practice it in the university while they're still learning, and then they can uh, flex their muscles a little bit. There was one guy in, in last or in this semester's lab, so I was con constantly talking to him in English in the labs, and he was constantly repeating in German, so he understood what I was saying, but he kept repeating everything in German. So I was like, okay, you can do this, but um, if you want to do this, we can uh, find a common ground here. So um, that was kind of interesting, but most students switch to English for this uh, lab because they also have to work with the exchange students a little bit, so there's a, the, the common course language. And of course, uh, I keep making changes to uh, the course because Especially in computer science, you can never uh, stick to one topic or with one topic you have to constantly learn yourself the new things that are happening in the systems. The systems change uh, themselves as well. So you have to constantly keep the stuff updated because otherwise the students would just leave if you uh, talk about this old stuff no one is using anymore. That's why I added Ansible and um, I'm already thinking about what new things I would add for the next iteration. So this is a yearly course, so I typically teach this in the winter term, which is uh, from October till uh, late January, and then in February there's typically the exam. Okay, uh, so why bother? Why should I teach this class, or why should I even spend my time with students so I could just sit in the university office and do my normal sysadmin work? Um, so I have the same motivation that I have uh, when I took the class myself, because I think that Unix skills are still relevant today, and that students in university don't get um, at least in our university, I think, don't get too much Unix as exposure. So um, I'm uh, managing our uh, big data cluster at our university, which is typically for master students, um, and it's all running Unix systems. So we have, um, currently we have um, Ubuntu on it and FreeBSD, so I'm trying to get more FreeBSD onto it, of course. Um, but what I find is that even the master students sometimes sit on, uh, in front of the terminal and don't know what kind of commands to enter. And this is typically that they didn't, know about um, Unix before or that they don't use Unix in their uh, private time. So um, I wanted to create this class or the motivation is still there to have the class there so that they get a little bit of exposure to, to Unix and do some, some programming on it. <coughs> and if, again, if you want to keep Unix alive, we need to train the people and we might as well start early with that because otherwise they are lost to some other operating system. And the idea is to um, even if I have a class of 40 students, maybe just five students will stick with Unix and the other ones are like, yeah, this is nice enough, but I'm going back to my other uh, Windows systems or Macs even. Um, but even the five that are left with the Unix um, impression or the Unix spirit, these are five more Unix people that we now have and they might become developers for some open source project one day, so this is already a benefit. Uh, they also need to or should know how to use Unix tools because as you know it's very flexible what you can do with Unix tools. We can combine them in different ways uh, just using pipes and all these things and knowing about this is very good for students for their toolbox that they now uh, later on bring into uh, um, companies because then they can say oh I can work on this CSV file with awk or I can um, write a shell script that does certain things on a server or I can use Ansible to do certain automations. And that's certainly uh, something that students should know, and then they can apply this also to many different other fields. Uh, but then people ask, yeah, why are you using BSD as a teaching tool? So why um, are you using this? Why can't you just use the, the Linuxes of this world? Well, the reasons are relatively simple. Uh, if you only have a hammer, then every problem looks like a, a nail. And so if people only use Linux, um, which is good, which is uh, totally fine if it solves the problem, but sometimes people try to apply the wrong solution to the right problem, and if they don't know about that there are other systems out there, they just try to apply the same solution which might not work, but if they know, ah, there's this other operating system out there that has other cool features that might apply better to this current situation or this current problem, then they're far better off because they have a better uh, way to decide which problem to fix in this way. And of course, uh, there are some features in the BSDs that the uh, Linuxes don't have or not yet have. So like OpenZFS or boot environments, Alan was talking about this earlier. And um, some of the free BSD based system utilities, I just don't want to miss. So I typically uh, show in the, in the class relatively many demos. Some fail relatively spectacular, but I switch between systems very often. So I show them top, for example, and I can uh, tell them, hey, look, in FreeBSD, I can say top 10. 
and on Linux I get an error message when I enter that. So it's these small things that uh, students um, experience in my class and see, ah, that's what's working on this system, and this is working on this other system, and so they can decide later on which is uh, better for their own purposes. And of course, the sources are available, that's also true for the Linuxes, of course, and um, they can also, um, they allow it um, to play with those, tinker it, change it, and um, work with it in different ways. Um, yeah, so some people ask me, hey, how can you teach if you're not a professor? So I'm not a professor, I'm employed, uh, I'm employed at the university. And some people think that only professors can teach at the university, which is not true, at least not in um, the way that I do it. So um, in Germany, you can typically go to a university and say, hey, I'm an expert in this kind of way because I have work experience, I've worked on this um, this particular operating system or this particular topic in computer science, if you want to go that uh, far. Um, and are you interested in that? I can talk, I can give a lecture about this. And um, many of the um, universities look for people like that because they cannot hope to cover all of these different uh, subjects that are out there and students are also interested in uh, getting practitioners in their field to talk about in class about their experiences and how it works in the real world later on. So. Um, that's my encouragement for you to, um, if you're interested in teaching and all these things, uh, that you should also um, maybe um, approach this. The, the pay is uh, probably not the, bo the best motivation for that, um, but it's certainly interesting to have this uh, interaction of um, teaching and learning and uh, seeing students uh, get better over the semester to get more um, exposure to the, to the system or to other uh, areas that you're interested in. So for me, it's a good combination of my um, sysadmin work that I'm doing on the big data cluster and also um, the lecture that I'm giving because I can carry over some of the tasks that I'm doing on the big data cluster into the lecture and also this way give the students a little bit more uh, ideas of what their later work might look like. So they might have to solve the same problems that I'm um, telling them about. So they might as well um, figure out solutions for that right away and not later on when they're in their job. So I try to make a lot of practical examples, um, and if I'm trying to do something all over again on the cluster, or something, hmm, that's probably something I should automate one day. So that's why I'm uh, doing a little bit more with Ansible, and then students see, ah, he's, so typically my lectures go like this. I present a problem, and I'm showing them possible solutions on the system, and then they can see, ah, he's solving it in this way, and there is a little bit of discussion happening typically, because there are often multiple ways to uh, skin a cat. Yeah, so uh, typical challenges when I start the semester, because students don't know me, I don't know what the students are like. So typically, um, since this is an elective course, I typically get the students that are already a little bit interested in Unix. I don't get the people who hate Unix with a passion, because they don't have to take the course. It's not a mandatory course. So I already have a little filter already um, that students who are working with Unix a little bit or just want to uh, see what the system can do, that I get those students and not the ones that I um, probably never see in this class. Um, but then, um, so I start um, telling them a little bit, you know, when classes are and how many uh, exam, or yeah, the exam a little bit or how many labs there are going to be. And then someone raises his hand in the back and says, which Linux distribution are we going to use in this course? And I go, all and none. So if you have a Unix distribution that you like and you can use that to solve all of the labs, then by all means use it. I'm not uh, indoctrinating you in any way. I just want to show you a LADA system. And if you hate this other system at the end of the class, that's fine. Use your own system. Uh, but for the students that are new to Unix anyway, I should give them at least some system that I think is best for them to learn with. And that's typically, um, so that keeps the, the people who, who say, ah, I want to run my Ubuntu, uh, or I want to run my Arch Linux, or I, whatever. And um, they can use that by all means, yeah. I, they can pretty much solve all the, the labs that I'm um, presenting them. And for the new students who are totally overwhelmed with the stuff that I'm presenting to them, I want to keep them in the class as well. So I should not um, drive them away by scaring them with a new operating system. So I'm trying to get these two groups still in the, in the same class. Uh, yeah, that's what I said here with uh, bo don't bore the first group. That, so some of the students already know more than I do. So they are like, yeah, okay, I just come to the first lecture and the last one before the exam, and then I'll see how I go. 
Um, that's fine because they don't get on my nerves this way. Um, but some of the well, yeah, um, and they pretty much finish up uh, pretty much all of the laps in one go. And I'm okay. You're you're the expert. Um, you can teach me a thing or two, but um, you just need the the laps for the actual exam later on. So, um, but most of the students are relatively new, and we have. Uh, many students who have a little bit of knowledge of Unix but want to know more, and these are exactly the students I want to have in my class, so I'm not trying to uh, scare them away too much. And ideally, even for the more advanced students, they should also know something new. So they probably never heard about OpenZFS or what Ansible is and what it can do. So this is the, the new parts that also makes them stick to the, to the class. And uh, the lab, first lab actually is the, the, challenge, the most challenging one for me, because in this one I try to bring everyone together. So the, the one group that is the experts who have installed probably 50 Unix systems uh, in their lifetime already, and some of them say, oh, I'm a system administrator in this company I'm working for in the, in the meantime. And I'm like, okay, sure, then go ahead, install the system that I'm presenting. But the people who are new, they've never installed the Unix system before, they want to have a little bit of hand-holding so I can uh, help them a little bit if they uh, enter a wrong command or created a, um, a, da a data set that's not the proper name or things like that. They need a little bit of help. So that's why I'm uh, having Lab 1 being the one that tries to sync everyone to the same uh, system because we're basically installing a uh, FreeBSD system from scratch. because. Although uh, people say that the installer is bad, pretty much every student could install the installer using the installation menu and go through the prompts. And that's pretty much not what computer science is about. They want to know what's happening in the system. Why are we partitioning disks? Why are we uh, copying files over and extracting them in certain directories? So this is the idea that I'm trying to give them there. Why are we using uh, this system in the way that we're using it? Yeah. Uh, do you explain uh, this stuff like partitioning and so on uh, on the first lesson? Because uh, there are a lot of topics uh, uh, related to just installation. Yeah, so the question was whether I explained these concepts of partitioning and um, uh, other things that I'm using before the actual lab starts. So the, the first lab is more descriptive, so it's kind of a uh, FreeBSD handbook chapter light to install the system. Um, but I give them also assignments, so they should not just blindly uh, type any commands in there. They also need to figure out what are the device names, what are the uh, ifconfig uh, con interfaces they need to configure. So these are the things they need to figure out in the lab themselves, but the rest is pretty much oh, a partition is a logical division of a, uh, of a hard drive in this case, and some of the things that I'm explaining. I'm also explaining them later in the um, uh, labs or the uh, lecture itself. It's just that the timing isn't right. If I would explain these system all in the labs uh, later on, the lecture would be lagging behind and vice versa. Uh, so it's a little bit of trade-off. It's a master course. No, not no, it's a bachelor's. It's undergraduate. It's immature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's the lab one. So this is the most difficult um, for me. Uh, but lab two is uh, then fine because then they have a system uh, set up. And yes, students. Uh, try out things and rack their system in interesting ways. That's why we create a boot environment in the very first lab. And I'm not giving them the lab for the, lab for the Mark 1 until I see that they have a boot environment ready to save their neck. Um, and this helped me a lot, because if, if students find out in the fourth lab that their system isn't booting anymore, then it's like, oh, well, you have to reinstall the whole system again. Not anymore. You just re restore the boot environment, and we're back to normal. So this way I can uh, make sure that I sleep well th so that students don't uh, send me email messages in the middle of the night and say, oh, I've crashed my system. Can you help me? Yes? What's a boot environment? So boot environments are a, a ZFS feature. That's why we're installing a FreeBSD on ZFS. Oh, the question was, um, what's a boot environment? Uh, the uh, a boot environment is basically a way to use OpenZFS to um, have multiple versions of um, your operating system or your file system, in this case ZFS. And uh, if you want to know more, Alan gave a talk two hours before this one about it, and uh, there's also a bunch of things. I, I also covered boot environments in the lecture a little bit, um, but this is a typical question a student would ask me also in lab one. Uh, what's this BEADM system I'm using? I've never used this before. Okay, that's fine, but I'm explaining it. So we have a, a chapter in the, in the lecture later on about file systems, and that's where I explain what um, ZFS is and what is a pool and what is a data set, uh, because most students have never heard about this. Of course, I cannot cover the whole ecosystem of OpenZFS. That would be a lecture of its own. 
Um, but the basics are there. I mean, you just know, need to know what a, uh, a pool is and what a data set is, and then you cover snapshots a little bit, and that typically gets them um, knowing what this is all about. Okay, so this is um, the, the, the challenge that I have. So the labs themselves, uh, I covered them a little bit already. So lab one is bring everyone on the same uh, page. Uh, we install a FreeBSD system in VirtualBox. Yes, a couple of people tried it in KVM. That's also working. And um, so it's just having uh, the same environment for everyone. If I, so um, two years ago, I let students install it on their own uh, physical machines. And there was one student was like, um, well, he didn't apparently did do the partitioning right or the boot environment management. <laughs> so what happened was he was trying to boot his Windows system again, uh, only to find out that it wasn't there anymore. <laughs> and the student for the rest of the lab was just sitting, staring blindly at his uh, laptop, and, uh, going through his head what kind of systems he lost and what kind of software licenses he had to get again. Uh, so that was kind of a, a letdown for me. So that's why I'm using it in a controlled environment. And because in VirtualBox all the devices have always the same name, no matter what kind of hardware the students bring. So we're not doing this on lab machines, so every student can bring their own machine. And so I have Asus Net, uh, the, the ThinkPads of this world, so all kinds of different um, hardware. And the exchange students have even more crazy hardware. So we have students from uh, South Korea, and even the, the keyboard layout, I want to try to help them a little bit and type something in. I was like, uh, well, mm, well, why don't you type a little bit? Um, but it's interesting for me. I learned a lot of stuff uh, helping these students. And some of these systems, they are only 32-bit, so they cannot uh, emulate a 64-bit FreeBSD system. So I was hoping they all die out by now, these old 32-bit systems. But they're still out there. Uh, lab 2 is basically uh, setting up an X environment because we're doing some um, GUI stuff later on. It's relatively simple, uh, but I want to have um, them not just work in the, um, <laughs> in the shell. Uh, so we install a little bit of an X environment. I'm using Fluxbox currently. I'm probably next year switching over to Lumina, so I'm trying how this works for the students. Uh, so this is a constant experiment, and uh, students are also a little bit of my guinea pigs, so <laughs> I'm trying new things on them. Uh, then lab three is about uh, basic shell commands. So you know, um, chain of pipes. We have a. I'm doing a little chain of pipes co contest. So um, the the group that creates the, the longest chain, so th with the most pipes in between, that does something useful on Unix, uh, they get a little prize. And so this is kind of interesting. How many pipes you can put into a, a system? Like they, they like get something from a file and pad paste it to something else, and then filter out something. And uh, it's certainly interesting what people uh, come up with. And then what I noticed is that students should know a little bit about GraphVis. Why? Uh, because students later on will write their thesis about some kind of topic. And the chances are relatively high that they should uh, visu visualize something there. And I found GraphVis really easy because you just provide a couple of instructions. And the computer is creating these nice graphs uh, that you can see. So I find this very helpful. And students um, in, from two semesters uh, after, my, after they finished my course, they say, yeah, thank you that you showed me this graph -vis thing. Then how can I create my thesis quicker without having to learn this graph -vis utility or some other uh, GUI um, you know, graph environment? Uh, so lab four is, so by the time we'll, we'll reach lab four, we already covered a lot of programming in the lecture. Uh, so we're doing shell scripting there and a lot of um, you know, basic things, C dialog things, and uh, creating a boot environment menu so they can um, have a little GUI environment to select the boot environment they want to switch to, and things like that. Uh, lab five, so uh, originally we had six labs, but time constraints in the lecture um, or in the, in the semester kind of um, had me cut the last lab because it's too close to the actual exam, so students should focus more on the exam by then. But lab five is basically integrating GrabSet and AWK into shell scripts so that they know um, which environment they're currently on because dollar one is different in the shell environment than it is in ARC, and they should know the difference between the two and how to pass like variables from uh, shell to ARC and vice versa. So um, that's what this lab is typically all about. And each of those labs has a little bit of open ZFS in it, so I'm not having a dedicated lab for ZFS itself. Well, lab one could be, but there's uh, much more steps in lab one than just uh, ZFS. So in, uh, there's always a little side uh, assignment in each lab that, that says, oh, um, let's create a couple of uh, desktop, uh, not desktop, um, data sets and um, set different compression level and then extract the port tree on it and see which is the best one for this case. 
so that they know also a little bit about the differences between the, the algorithms that OpenZFS is using and things like that. Okay, uh, the exam. Oh, this is kind of a nice uh, section of the presentation. Um, so the exam questions typically focus on the um, stuff that I covered in the lecture, of course, and um, some um, shell script writing. So I typically um, ask the students what kind of helpers they want to use. So I have uh, three stages. So an easy exam does uh, allow no helpers, so no uh, nothing. They just bring their brains, hopefully, and their uh, writing skills. Uh, a medium-sized difficulty exam will have them bring a piece of paper that they wrote themselves. So if people are like super nervous and get blackouts, they still have their piece of paper where they wrote certain things down. And um, we, <laughs> I also had give them the choice to have a very uh, difficult exam where they can bring everything, computers, books, but no group ever uh, selected this option. I don't know why. Uh, most of them chose just easy uh, exams. And that's what I um, typically do. So in an easy exam, yeah? So they have uh, just paper and pen pencil, no computer? Yeah, exactly. They cannot check their source code. But that's if I have an easy exam, I say you, you must at most write 10 lines of shell. Mm -hmm. And I think that's parsable in, your, uh, in the brain that you have at that point. And, um, or sometimes I give them source code that's wrong, that has errors in it. And I, I, at one point, I, have a, I had a shell script that has like three syntax errors in it. And the first one was in line one, so I switched around the, the bin sh, in, so it's um, hash bang bin sh, and I switched around the bang and the, and the hash. And there was one student in the, in the lab or in the exam sitting five minutes. The last one, everyone left already, had handed in their exams. That person said, I want to find this one error in this exam. He was like totally crazy. I said, OK, hand it in. If you hand it in, I will tell you where the error is. OK, so he handed it in. It's like in the first line, the bin sh was switched around. And he's like, oh, no. <laughs> because this is the line that everyone is not looking at. And they just think, ah, it's, the, it's just working, and yeah. This is, this is fun. Um, yeah, but no student ever failed this class, uh, although some exchange students last semester tried really hard. So what they did, they wrote the whole exam with pencil. I don't know if that's a thing, but that's what I did. And then before handing it in, they erased everything again. But so badly that I could still read the stuff in there. So I graded it as normal. Uh, they barely passed. And um, yeah, I wish them well. They probably weren't, will never use Unix again. Uh, <laughs> uh, but here I have a typical question from my exam, so maybe you know about this one. So Doc McIlroy formulated uh, three ideas that form the basic philosophy of Unix. So this is my introductory lecture typically where I talk a little bit about Unix history. So you probably heard about this before, write programs that do hmm, and do, yeah, yes. Second one, write programs to, yes, and write programs to handle. Text streams, because that is a universal interface. Excellent. You just passed. Um, <laughs> so here are the uh, solutions. So here I uh, photographed a couple of the solutions that students handed in. Uh, exam gold. So this is what the first, uh, so this is after grading it. So um, this is typically what you get. You can see already that they didn't learn this uh, question. Um, so it gets better. Uh, stuff is always the right solution. <laughs> if you don't know the answer, it's stuff. Um, make life easier. Yeah, of course. Why not? That's what programs are for. Uh, <laughs> next one. So this is a three-point question. How, how much can you lose in this one? Uh, right, yeah. Uh, I like the memes part in this one because, yeah. So this, you, you sit down with your a stack of exams to correct, and uh, correct, wrong, correct. And then you read certain things like this, and uh, this kind of brings an, a smile to your face. And I saved the best for last. Uh, write programs that do enough and do not, uh, what? OK. Uh, next one is write programs to automate processes, and write programs to handle this test, because it's a pain in the <clears throat> OK. That's all kind of uh, uh, feedback for me how the, how the difficulty of the test was. So <laughs> this is the stuff that I have to deal with. Um, yeah, so things that I noticed um, from the students indirectly or from the feedback that they gave me about this class, um, so that many of the students nowadays come with uh, 
computers that have only a GUI environment. Some people bring their tablets, some people bring their mini laptops that have only a little GUI on it. And then telling them, well, you have to go to this black and white uh, input environment. That's kind of a horror for them because that is like the, the old ages of the computing environment. So, but more and more students are bringing these and they have never used anything else before. So they're all uh, using GUIs and it's kind of difficult to bring them into the Unix environment if they only know uh, GUI environments and mouse clicks. And of course, uh, this is uh, typically for the um, students who have already uh, used the Linux system a little bit. They um, think that bin bash is the prompt that you should use for shell scripting and they write perfect scripts and then I say, well, why are you using bin, as bin bash? You can run the same script for, with bin sh because you're not using any specialties that the bash provides in this programming. And they were, uh, oh, interesting, I didn't know that it worked in BinSH. So that's probably why, um, yeah. And then I tell them about portability because trying to port this bin bash script to a uh, FreeBSD system or some other Unix system won't work because that's a different path. Because bash, as you know, is not in the FreeBSD base system. And then they say, yeah, okay, I, I change it to BinSH. And then they're reluctantly uh, changing that script and hand it in. Uh, but there's also things, so I always view teaching as not as a one-way street, so as much as I teach the students, I get um, as much information back, even though they don't actively teach me. Um, so the feedback that they give me indirectly is, um, when I'm holding a lecture like this, you don't have to be perfect, you don't have to um, pronounce every word correctly, they still understand what you mean. They also, um, if you have a bad day and uh, give a very bad lecture and at the end, a uh, student comes to you and said, oh, wow, I learned as much in this lecture as, uh, as ever. And it's like, oh, wow, great. Uh, so don't worry, be crappy. You can still um, teach enough students that they will um, not hate you forever. Um, and you don't have to do this old stick. Okay, so they, they were learning about Unix system. Yeah, loosen up a little bit. You can do this, a little, maybe not on the first time you're doing this, um, but students typically react to this more lively interaction and they like um, a little bit more um, some jokes in the lecture, for example. So, and Unix pretty much provides the best environment to do this. So sometimes, so I've been uh, SL installed, and if I mistype SL, then the, the train <laughs> drives through my screen, everyone laughs, and yeah, that's how, it, um, that, that's how you keep the students interested in. I mean, 90 minutes lecture is already hard for some students. Um, but yeah, this is uh, the, the, the world we're living in. So this is the stuff that I try to, to do in the future. So I, I think when we're in a, in a nice desktop environment, uh, we also should uh, let shell script send uh, notifications to the desktop so they can see, ah, there's something happening and that uh, you get some kind of feedback from the shell script. Uh, the lecture is uh, also going to change a little bit, so I'm trying to do a little bit less of slides. So I typically my slides look very much a uh, wall of text, but I'm not reading the slides, so I'm just giving the slides out for students so that they can read it afterwards in like a, a prose text. And I'm doing a lot of demos in the uh, lecture, which has me prepare the lecture in a certain way. So if I'm um, teaching uh, a section on, on AWK, I need to brush up my uh, actual <coughs> practical experience with AWK because I might not have used it in like half a year, and then I need to see whether all the scripts still work. And, but doing this on a live system is much more interesting to students rather than reading it from the slides because if you put stuff on slides, yeah, everything works on slides all the time. But if you're doing it on a live system, you can see all the different things that break. Or that um, someone has changed uh, something in the operating system which you didn't uh, know about, then, oh, the commands I was using don't work anymore. Mm, I should change that and fix my slides. Um, I'm also thinking about introducing uh, D-Trace uh, to students. Um, I had George Neville Neal teach at my university for uh, two times already, and um, the way that he teaches D-Trace is very unique in uh, the whole TeachBSD approach. But um, my lecture is only limited to like 14 weeks, and it's kind of difficult to cram D-Trace into there. I want to give them not just a brush overview from D-Trace, but also um, focus on actual problems they can solve with D-Trace and I think of um, creating its own lecture for D-Trace for the undergraduates so I'm still thinking about how to integrate this properly. Uh, I also find uh, performance measuring super interesting and I also want to expose the students to that because that's probably what they're also going to do later on in their, in their jobs. They pretty much have all the programs written by then and it's just programs behaving badly and uh, having performance problems and that's what they have to deal with in the future. 
And people who don't know this, so Kahoot is an uh, interactive application where you can um, ask questions and the students can answer them on their mobile phone and you can get a kind of a result here, what kind of answers the students were giving and kind of a statistic. And that's how you can also say, say to students, okay, these are the slides that I was presenting today. Uh, let's go home and if you didn't understand anything, do this Kahoot thing to like a, a self-control and this way you can see what you learned in this lecture or what kind of stuff you need to repeat again. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much the end of it. Yeah, perfect time for questions. <laughs> uh, how many students in average uh, uh, do that Kahoot uh, uh, questionnaire? Uh, yeah, I need to create that first. So that was my, my, uh, the thing that I want to do in the future. I haven't done that yet. Uh -huh. So yeah. that's my, um, yeah, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, I need to repeat the question. So he was asking how many students are using that Kahoot. So I haven't created the questions yet. I need to basically go through my slides all over again and think about questions that they should answer, which shouldn't also be exam questions because otherwise it's too easy. And if you ever create a curriculum, then you can see that you can only uh, ask so many questions because the material is, is there. You can only uh, ask questions about the material that you have. And if you don't have enough material, then you pretty quickly run out of questions. But this is certainly an interactive way because you have always students sitting in the back and you know, I'm, they have their laptops open and can, I can see that they're on Facebook and not on my lecture slides. So yeah, but that's the way it is. That gives a little bit more interactivity to a relatively boring um, lecture. Yeah, the question was whether there's a, a, a theme that um, the students like or what they want to see in, in future lectures. Um, yeah, so they're interested in the Ansible stuff, definitely. That's why I'm now teaching this also at uh, certain BSD conferences. Um, because the topic is still relatively new, the whole configuration management stuff. And um, uh, OpenZFS is definitely interesting to them because most of them have never heard about this. And they're also um, seeing what features it has, so I cover um, snapshots and um, boot environments, as I said. So they're like, ooh, wow, that's in an operating system, file system? Wow, I need to check this out. And that's typically what I get as feedback. Just one yeah. second before yeah, sure. letting you finish. Uh, for those living, uh, we need to leave the place clean. So if you have trash around you, bottles, whatever, you have a trash can uh, yeah. leaving this room on the outside. is a big one. So you can put everything on it. Thank you very much. All right. Um, More questions? Oh, here we go. So you answered my deep first question, but uh, ah. there was a question on the internet if you uh, introduce sick info to uh, your students. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that's typically what I do when I uh, tell about differences. Oh, the, um, whether I introduce sick info to the students. Yes, that's what I'm doing. I also write articles in the FreeBSD Journal about sick info, even though they are small. Um, so. SIG info is one thing where you can say, oh, look, this is different from the, the Linuxes of this world. And if I type control T, then the system gives me something back. And I also will um, cover traps in the shell scripting section so that they can write their own control T handler. And they can say, oh, this program is now giving me that message. And this other key combinations creates other um, messages here. So this is typically uh, the difference between that I'm trying to focus on in the lecture. Uh, next. Oh, wow. A lot of questions. Uh, is it necessary to study an associated C programming with Linux? Ah, so, um, yeah, the question was whether there is C programming in the lecture. Uh, originally there was, um, but again, if you teach a whole programming language, well, they, they cover programming in the first two semesters, which is C++. And um, so uh, Professor Schütte did it in a way that he only covered the, the differences between C and C++. But again, if you cover C, then you can not do it in just one lecture. You can do so many things in C. And if you're doing uh, programming in Unix in the, in the kernel environment, that pretty much warrants its own lecture because you can do a lot of stuff in there than just um, the things that I cover. But it's certainly worth uh, while teaching that to them. Um, this could be the third lecture that I'm teaching. Oh, wow. If I'm not appearing in any future BSD conferences that you know I'm totally stuck now in teaching at university courses that I think are relevant to them. Um, yeah, this is the, the, the trade-off that I'm doing. Uh, yeah, yep. Um, how, when you're looking to add new content to your courses, uh, what do you look for? What inspires you to, to play something? Uh, do you have a certain teaching goal in mind? For 
Yeah, so the question was, um, when, I knew, when I add new content to the lecture, what are the things that I'm looking for or what inspires me to, um, to add them? So typically I add stuff that interests me because I typically create lectures that I wanted to visit myself, but they weren't offered back in the day. Um, so I'm, I'm also um, switching interests a couple of times. So I'm currently uh, totally into monitoring and you know, a little bit into DevOps. Uh, uh, I'm also going, but I cannot put everything in this one lecture. It still has its own uh, theme. It has its own curriculum. Um, but I, if I find a, an, if I um, finish a topic earlier than I was anticipating, then I um, add a little bit of um, stuff at the end at the, of the, before the exam starts, so that this is not in the exam itself. But students who are interested in this, they can see, oh, this is also happening on Unix, or you can do these things on Unix. Follow-up question. Yeah. So you're basically following. The yeah, so I also see a certain, oh, I'm, I'm also following the, the trend or the market a little bit. Yeah, a little bit because it interests me and I think that's also interesting when the students going out into the industry to work there. And if we not, don't teach them the stuff in university, then they have to be trained on the job and that's a little bit late. <coughs> or they don't get a job at all, which is worse. Yeah. And you should also teach them to learn stuff for themselves. They cannot just sit there and, yeah, let someone else talk in front of the class and um, don't start learning yourself. That's the actual goal of the whole uh, university education. Follow your interests, do what you're interested in, and then get interested in certain things. Yeah. Thanks. Very interesting talk. Uh, I didn't say it, but uh, have you considered to introduce your students to version control? Ah, the question was whether I was um, introducing my students to version control. Um, so I keep that for the first and second semester because they are doing a little bit of version control there with Subversion and Git. Yeah, that's already the flame war starting. And um, yeah, it's typically not part of the lecture, but I, can, I could do a basic Git introduction there that isn't too <coughs> difficult. But um, they don't have to have version control for the small ex assignments that I'm giving them. I could do one that covers the whole lecture or the whole um, exam period, or I could a pro do a project that covers lab one to six that they have to you know, follow along. Um, that would be something I could try, but there's no necessity in this case to have a, a big version control where you have merges and um, different conflicting versions around. Um, typically, the students program on their own device, show it to me, and I'm, I'm marking it up as complete. Um, you said that uh, some of your students are um, continuing uh, using FreeBSD. Um, what are the, the main reasons for them, for example, not using FreeBSD longer than in your course and uh, continuing in, uh, using Linux? Yeah, the question was uh, whether some of the students um, that continue using FreeBSD and whether that's um, or what the, the reasons for that are and why are they not going back to Linux. Um, so the outcome rel is relatively small because uh, at first I don't see what they're doing after my class. So I, I always send them a message after the exam, hey, congratulations, you passed, and I want to keep in touch with you, or you can still send me questions even though the, the class is officially over. Um, and few students sent me a message uh, in, uh, a couple of years later, oh, I'm now working in a job, and what you told me in, in AUK I didn't see back then, but now I'm totally in this environment, I need this. Um, that's a little bit late to, to figure this out. Um, but the, the outcome, it's, again, it's not an indoctrination class to, to FreeBSD. It's not my intent to, to show them, oh, this is the one true operating system. I want to give them a, a broader view that there's not just one system out there, whether it, it's FreeBSD or Linux. I want to broaden their horizon so that they can apply a certain uh, problem with one system or the other. So the outcome is typically, out of 40 students, maybe two or five maybe will use FreeBSD after that. It's, it's kind of a bad outcome, but the five students who are using it, they will stick with that. And some of the students just can't be taught to, to use this particular system because I don't want to uh, tell them, oh, you have to use this one system from, the rest, from now on until the rest of your life. Uh, that, would be, that would be bad. I wish there would be more people coming to me afterwards, oh, I want to join FreeBSD or other open source operating system projects, but I think I give them enough uh, tools and uh, insights so that they can start this later because they're also um, studying five other classes in parallel and they need to 
work those uh, as well as, the, as, as my class. And maybe after, you don't know what, the, what they're doing in their free time, so maybe they have uh, other interests in doing offline open source projects, things like that. Uh, actually, if you're looking for the slides, they're available on my webpage here. Uh, you can find them in the, I uh, uploaded the slides already. You can just click this one and you can uh, get to my webpage. And that's where you find all the lectures, all the exams, not the exams, the actual, uh, <laughs> that would be nice. Yeah, students <laughs> finding this link and it's like, oops. Uh, but here are the actual uh, slide decks. There's a little ZFS introduction. There's Ansible for the students for interested. There's a trial exam. I, hopefully I uploaded not the real exam there. Um, but yeah, if you're interested, look at the slides. Uh, there's also the lab assignments if you want to do them. Oh, now I'm getting from <laughs> random people lab assignments complete and they want to <laughs> have them marked up. Um, <laughs> but yeah, this is the, the, the giveaway for people to just look at this. I mean, most of the content for you will be boring and it's just repetition of the basics. Um, but maybe there's something new for in, uh, for in it for you. So, or give this to other people. There's no copyright or anything. I hate people just hiding their lecture slides behind some learning portal and put a password on it. This is open source still. This is stuff you should give to people because education is there for educating people, not hide it from them. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, I have maybe longer questions, so I'm not sure if we have. Or we can also do it afterwards. We are completely out of the. <laughs> out, of, no, out of time, out of any. Oh, there's a minus between the available yeah. time left. <laughs> Ooh. My, uh, uh, you said very interesting thing uh, that uh, students are asking questions. Yeah, they uh, should. I, I'm from uh, Czech Technical University in Prague, and uh, I'm currently wor working here. And mm -hmm. the problem, maybe, maybe it's uh, based on the uh, uh, national details or something. And that uh, students barely ask questions. Uh, this semester I, I have uh, one, one course and I was uh, trying to uh, make students more active mm. to, to ask why I was asking them a question. Yeah, that's difficult. Uh, and, and, uh, trying to somehow... Uh, Class dismissed, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, 